Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here nice and early, and um, we're excited to get started with our first session. My name is Amber Taylor, and I'm the moderator for, for this first session this morning. All right, so let me um, get started with some uh, information on our presenters this morning. We'll start with Jeff Turner, and he's a PhD candidate at the University of Utah studying immigration, religion, and, and the American West. He's also been active in the digital humanities and recently worked on two digital history projects, um, the Century of Black Mormons and Utah Historical Markers. In addition, he worked on a project called Native Places Atlas, which provides a digital map of Utah onto which native peoples can provide names um, for places. I think these are really cool projects. And uh, yeah, well done. Um, he will be presenting a paper called Polygamy, Religious Freedom, and Immigration Law. And in that paper, he looks at this question of um, religious freedom and immigration law through the experience of Herminia, am I saying that right? Herminia Walzer, um, when she came as a, as a convert to the church, um, at the border was asked the question about her uh, perspective on polygamy. It became an issue and, and her response to that. It's a, it's, a, it's a fascinating question. And I will here turn the time over to Jeff. Thank you, Amber, and thank you everyone for being here. Just as a, another slight announcement, we're gonna try and get uh, Brett's paper on a laptop, so we might take a minute after my presentation. Um, so we'll just get rolling. Do you believe in polygamy or the practice of polygamy? This is the question that Swiss migrant Herminia Walzer faced at America's border in 1908. Herminia responded, quote, no, that is the only doctrine of the church that I don't agree with and with which a woman can't easily agree. After identifying as Roman Catholic, the, the inspectors asked if she, quote, intends to forsake that religion to become a Mormon. Herminia responded that she, quote, came to the United States so as to find out whether it is really worthwhile to give up my Roman Catholic church for a Mormon one. She migrated to discover for herself whether Mormons still practice polygamy in Utah, and if not, then she implied that she might join. The board moved, quote, that this alien be discharged as she, being a Roman Catholic, comes here to investigate the Mormon religion, not saying definitely whether or not she will embrace that religion and not believing in polygamy or the practice of polygamy. The only problem, though, was that Latter-day Saint missionaries had baptized Hermedia Walzer months earlier. Walter was already Mormon and had lied to the inspectors about not being so. Herminia's experience at the border brings together diverse strands of legal and religious histories in one moment. By the 1880s, the United States federal government had legislated against Mormon polygamy, consolidated control over immigration, and expanded federal power at the border. They fully federalized immigration control in the 1891 Immigration Act, which added polygamist as an excludable category of migrants. In 1907, the federal government revised the category by adding, quote, or persons who admit their belief in the practice of polygamy. And in doing so challenged the 1879 distinction between legislating against religious belief and religious practice from United States v. Reynolds. By 1908, Mormons had ad adapted to these border mechanisms and facilitated the flow of migrants through the border. My presentation discusses the question that Herminia Walzer faced in 1908. It details the origins and development of the polygamy question in immigration law, where migrant rights differed from constitutional ones in subtle but important ways. It also offers some responses to this question from Muslim migrants in California and Mormon migrants in Boston just after the turn of the 20th century. These were moments <clears throat> of institutional inquiry and religious expression. In studying questions and answers, we can better understand the relationships between immigration law, religious freedom, and individual rights. In doing so, we might make sense of Herminia Walzer's strategy of passing and the ways that her story is fundamentally entangled with the religious strangers who encounter the same mechanism at the other end of a continent. So let's turn to the origins of a question. In the beginning was the Everett Circular. Failure to control polygamy on American soil prompted United States Secretary of State William Everts to identify the foreign roots of Mormon polygamy in European converts. In 1879, Everts sent a message to foreign countries aimed at preventing Mormon migration. The circular urged foreign governments to, quote, take such steps as may be compatible with their laws and usages to check the organization of these criminal enterprises by agents who are thus operating beyond the reach of the law of the United States. 
Since states controlled immigration policies at the time, the circular presented a viable solution for the Secretary of State to deal with Mormon immigration as a foreign policy problem. Other scholars, such as Artis E. Partial, have argued that the circular had a lasting impact throughout the rest of the 1880s on Mormon proselytizing abroad. <clears throat> I argue that the circular echoed the ways that the federal government turned to other resources in order to stem Mormon migration. So let me describe one example. In 1887, the Swiss government communicated with the United States Secretary of State over Mormon migration. Bern police officers thoroughly investigated Mormon emigration and determined that, quote, Mormon emissaries are in every sense emigration agents and the emigrants are obtained, uh, obtained by them are all destined for the United States. The Swiss police's investigation described comprehensive surveillance of local community members, critical discussion of a variety of polarized newspaper depictions of Swiss Mormon migrants after their arrival in the United States, engagement with Mormon mission print culture, which means that some Swiss dudes got their hands on some Western Americana, it's pretty cool and a determination that Switzerland had insufficient legal mechanisms to prevent Mormon emigration. They reported these findings to Secretary of State Thomas Bayard. Significantly, Bayard responded by suggesting Swiss officials could use the 1885 alien contract labor law to determine Mormon emigration. The law made assisting or funding migrants for the promise of labor or service of any kind illegal. Bayard believed that Mormon emigrants who use church money, quote, come within the letter of this law. Given missionaries' involvement in emigration, there, quote, can be but little doubt that they may, do make agreements, express or implied, to labor or give service upon arrival in the territory of Utah as a way of guaranteeing funding for the help of emigrating. Bayard's communication came the same year that Congress disincorporated the Perpetual Emigrating Fund under the Edmunds Tucker Act, and these efforts point towards stemming polygamy through preventing migration. By the end of 1887, Bayard's pointing toward the alien contract labor law meant, uh, suggested that stemming Mormon migration uh, meant incorporating the Mormon question within broader efforts to centralize immigration laws under federal control. On December 12th of that year, Senator Thomas Palmer of Michigan proposed an immigration bill similar to the 1882 Immigration Act, but added a list of identities for exclusion. One excluded identity was, quote, any believer or professed believer in the Mormon religion who sails to satisfy the consul upon examination that he or she intends to and will conform to and obey the laws of the United States. Palmer's bill made its way to the Committee on Foreign Relations, but did not return for debate. It was the only bill before the middle months of 1888 to include Mormons within federal immigration law and the only to do so by religious name. In 1888, Congress mandated the creation of the Ford Commission, a congressional investigatory body that would submit a report detailing immigration practice under the 1882 Immigration Act. And this is pretty, pretty common. After the Ford Committee, there are tons of investigations, most famously uh, the 19, 1907 to 1911 Dillingham Commission. Um, but Congress is super interested in producing knowledge about immigration and their, their policies at the border. <clears throat> In the Ford Commission report, Congress heard testimony from immigration inspectors indicating that they had little means of policing polygamists and thereby could not stop Mormon migration. In the wake of the report, the majority of immigration bills proposed during 50th, the 50th Congress from 1887 to 1889 contained polygamists as an excludable category. Subsequent bills did not name Mormons explicitly, likely due to a potential conflict with the establishment, establishment clause of the First Amendment. Nevertheless, Mormon migration became a consistent part of proposed immigration legislation through the language of polygamy. Debate and disagreement over other parts of Im major immigration bills, though, prevented enemy immigration acts from being passed <clears throat> excuse me, until the next meeting of Congress when the 1891 Immigration Act passed and banned polygamists from entering the country for the first time. So stepping back, in this moment, Federal immigration law and the polygamy question inhabited some odd legal space. Historian Lucy Sawyer has argued that immigrants didn't possess the same rights as citizens in terms of due process. Historian Julia Rose Kraut has argued that the Bureau of Immigration and Federal Courts interpreted exclusion based on ideology as, quote, an immigration issue rather than as a First Amendment issue. 
Since foreign migrants didn't possess adequate rights to due process, and since courts interpreted ideological exclusion as an immigration issue, exclusions and deportations based on belief were insulated, quote, from substantial judicial review and constitutional protections under the Fifth Amendment. As a result, immigration proceedings punished foreigners in the United States for their beliefs, associations, and expressions through the expulsion or threat of expulsion. Polygamy presents a unique opportunity to understand the role of religious freedom within this odd space of policing belief at the border. Religious studies scholar Tisa Wenger has argued that religious freedom within American empire presented both a rhetoric that undergirded imperial expansion and also provided means for civil, civilizational protect, protection under the First Amendment. Borders, as historian Paul Kramer has argued, became reflections of the ways that nation states could protect citizens' rights while preventing the entry of immoral global subjects as demonstrations of a nation's own power in a globalizing world. And historian Julian Lim argues that polygamy and immigration law shows the importance of religion within this context and highlights the complicated nexus of belief, empire, religion, race, and sexuality. I think that these historiographies should speak to one another. The, procl the proclivity to police belief within immigration law demonstrates limits of religious freedom there. Inspectors' questions and migrant responses, I think, reveal how both utilized logics of religion and empire to navigate their encounters with each other at the border. By focusing on a question about polygamy at the border, we can see how inspectors made religion legible as undesirable, and how migrants constructed or hid their religious selves as strategies of passing through the border. In short, I think we can see odd permutations and maybe violations, though I'm not, I'm not a law, I'm not a lawyer, not a legal historian technically, uh, I just read some stuff. Um, maybe violations of the establishment and free exercise closet, clauses at the edges of an American nation. So back, back to the question. In 1907, the language of this polygamy question changed, from, changed to the form that Herminia Walzer encountered one year later. Reports since the 1891 Immigration Act had consistently revealed the clause's ineff inefficacy at excluding polygamists. The problem had to do with proof. Senator William Dillingham reported that even though immigration inspectors could technically exclude polygamists, their experience, quote, has been that while polygamists are debarred from under the present law, they were compelled to admit persons who could not be proven to be polygamists, but who freely admitted their belief in the practice of polygamy. If officers could not prove who was actively practicing polygamy, or actively prove who was and who was not actively practicing polygamy, then the question about polygamy had to change. Senator Dillingham noted, this amendment was added at the suggestion of those officers. The revised clause added a question about, quote, belief in the practice of polygamy, rather than just being a polygamist. Getting to this language, though, was a small process of revision. The original amendment in 1907 added, quote, being a believer in polygamy rather than, quote, belief in the practice of polygamy. Senator George Sutherland of Utah asked whether uh, it was the intention um, by that to provide a person who entertains a mere belief in polygamy may be excluded, or whether it was applied to one who is violating the law and who believes in the practice of polygamy. The difference to Sutherland was about, quote, mere abstract belief. Senator William Dillingham responded, I do not know what was in the mind of the House when they passed the bill, so punting a little bit, but that he thought it referred to belief in the practice of polygamy. Sutherland suggested that the Senate revise the amendment to reflect that language, otherwise the amendment is, quote, going too far. The Senate agreed to the language change from a believer in polygamy to belief in the practice of polygamy, and the House shortly agreed afterward. When immigrant inspectors stopped Herminia Walzer in Boston in 1908, they asked an entire shipload of Mormon and non-Mormon migrants. Also, there's a, great question, or there's a great story about how that came to be, so happy to deal with that in Q&A if we have time. Um, but they asked an entire shipload of Mormon and non-Mormon migrants this revised question about their beliefs in polygamy, sometimes in Mormonism, and sometimes in religion broadly. Mormon responses to the polygamy question highlighted mostly historical distance. One of Walzer's shipmates, for example, responded to the polygamy question with, quote, no, sir, we don't believe in it. 
When inspectors asked about believing in the practice of polygamy, he continued, no, it has not been practiced for about 18 years. Another said, no, not one of the whole gang believes in polygamy. That is a fairy tale of former years. When they asked how long ago since um, the church cast aside the practice of plural wives, the migrant responded, 18 years ago, because it wasn't legal. For many Mormons who landed in Boston in 1908, the polygamy question prompted responses that positioned their church's relationship with polygamy through historical distance, identified Mormonism as mo a modernly monogamous religion, and positioned themselves as potentially desirable citizens. Questions in Boston in 1908, though, extended beyond polygamy toward religious belief. Inspectors asked questions like, what do you believe as to the Mormon faith? Responses varied. One migrant gave, quote, the real truth. There are many churches, but there is not one of them the real church um, as her belief in Mormonism. Another stated, quote, I believe the only Bible as it is, I believe only the Bible as it is written. Others, though, spoke religious belief into their migratory journeys in Utah, similar to 19th century rhetorics of the gathering. I just came on, an, on account of my belief. One of our articles of faith is that we believe this little literal gathering, or the little gathering shall go to Zion and live on the Mormon continent. That's the reason most of us come out, for the gospel's sake. And, well, I wanted to be in the promised land. That is why I came here. Since Herminia traveled as a single woman, hiding her Mormon identity likely offered a sense of security against the popular trope that missionaries seduced gullible women. At the very least, it prompted different questions from inspectors who asked about her encounters with missionaries and why she thought Mormons were so successful at proselytizing. And she gives some pretty, pretty interesting example, examples in response to that. But again, for Q&A, if, if you're curious. Muslim migrants in the West, though, encountered different iterations of the polygamy question. Some inspectors there equated believing in Islam with believing in polygamy, regardless of migrant responses. This assumption resulted in hundreds of deportations across multiple ports of entry, including every mi Indian migrant in Seattle in 1910. It also caused international uproar from representatives of the Ottoman government. In 1913, Commissioner General of Immigration, Anthony Caminetti, issued a statement in which he specifically advised immigrant inspectors to ask about polygamous belief without asking about whether a migrant was Muslim. Inspectors in San Francisco, however, did not abide by this directive. In 1914, for example, they asked Munshi Khan if he, quote, believed in the Quran. He responded, yes. The inspector's subsequent, subsequent question connected Islam with polygamy. The Quran teaches that it is right for a man to have more than one wife. Do you, do you believe in those teachings? Khan's response dictated both that polygamy, quote, is not compulsory according to the Quran, and also that he, quote, didn't believe in it. In response to the same question in the same year, uh, a different migrant, Maoshi Khan, responded, quote, I'm not even married. How would I get more than one wife? <laughs> when inspectors prompted hi the hypothetical of having multiple wives, if he were, quote, well fixed, Maoshi Khan responded with a simple no. Where Mormon responses created distance between a religion's past history and its present practice, Muslim responses to questions about the Quran and polygamy created distance between religious text and belief. All but two Mormon migrants passed through the border in Boston in 1908, whereas, as best as my research shows, about one in 10 Muslim migrants were excluded because of polygamy, regardless of their answers to the question, um, though a higher ratio were excluded for, for other discriminatory prejudice-based um, justifications. These moments highlight different access to the protections and restrictions inherent in the establishment and free exercise clauses of the First Amendment. For mostly white Mormons arriving in the East, the polygamy question prompted responses about historical distance and expressive belief. For Muslim migrants of color, inspectors sometimes embedded polygamy with Muslim identity through religious text. Responses also expressed belief, but failed to overcome the religious racial prejudice that American imperial expansion had augmented. In the limited rights space of immigration law, an unusual question about marital belief carried the religious roots from which it was born and reveals the different accesses to religious freedom that Herminia and her Muslim contemporaries encountered on different ends of the same country. Thank you all for listening.